Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Colin Howells here once again uh, with another study in the series on the book of Revelation in Colin's Corner. I hope you are well today and enjoy this uh, study that we do to, together. Uh, can I invite you to uh, click the link at the bottom uh, of the page when it comes up on, on YouTube? That will be an encouragement uh, to me and anybody else who is following this series of studies. We come to uh, Revelation chapter 19, the beginning of Revelation chapter 19. Uh, Blessed are the invited. So can I invite you uh, to follow uh, this uh, particular study uh, with me this morning. As a, a retired missionary and pastor, I'm constantly amazed and dismayed at the same time at what seems to be the constant infighting between individuals and denominations not only in the United States and in Great Britain, but even further afield. The subjects range generally from a different theological stance to other believers, even going down to the version of the scriptures that some people consider to be inspired. Now, whilst it is necessary to denounce those who depart from the clear teaching of scripture, on such things as marriage and sexuality. Arguments over historical and doctrinal positions, the choice of Bible translations, I find to be totally unacceptable. There are millions of people across the world who have never heard of these different nuances, and they would be happy just to have a copy of God's Word and to be able to read it in their own language. The Trinitarian Bible Society, the Wycliffe uh, translators, have been translating the Bible into French, into Tagalog, into Tamil, and none of these different versions go back to the King James Version or what has been known as the Textus Receptus. So may I humbly suggest that Christian bloggers and vloggers cease their negative online campaigns of infighting and try to focus on that which unites us, seeking to call the name of Christ in a, into a dark and perverse generation in which we live. We are here to make him known and to live in such a way as he is seen of being worthy of praise and glory. God has invited a great multitude to the wedding supper of the Lamb, and we should be preparing ourselves for that event instead of tearing each other apart. As we approach the final unveiling of God's almighty plan, John starts to reveal more and more of the final victory of the Lamb and the celebrations which accompany that triumph. Following the opening revelations of the one who walked among the candlesticks in the opening chapter, and then the next two chapters focusing on the struggles of God's persecuted church, facing as it did the power of the Roman Empire, manifested throughout by the omnipresent Roman Empire. In the manner of a modern-day film director, John now carries his readers forward in an ever-increasing rush to the end of time. This means, of course, that the Roman Empire and the emperors, presented in Revelation as being Babylon the Great, are in fact symbolic, symbolic pictures of all human empires throughout history. All empires which are determined to rebel against Almighty God and persecute his people. Beginning with the final two bold judgments in chapter 16, John focuses more specifically on the events associated with the fall of Babylon and the events associated with the end of the age 
which he describes in the last few chapters of his book. As we consider chapter 19 and John's description of the wedding celebrations, we find a stark contrast with the previous chapters, the total destruction of Babylon. We're reminded here why it is why it is that our God is worthy of single-minded, wholehearted praise and worship and enjoyment. Verses 1 to 9 tell us that our God is a God of salvation, of glory and of power, that his judgments are true and just, that he vindicated his servants and avenges their blood, that he is the God of both great and small, that he is almighty God who reigns over everything that he has made and that he is the God from all eternity, that his son Jesus Christ would have a bride, a people that he has redeemed from sin and death, to whom he has given spotless linen to wear and with whom he now celebrates in the great wedding supper. If we place these verses in the context of what has gone before, we see that virtually everything that we have found in chapters 17 and 18 is a description of the judgment that God will pour out on Babylon. We can go back to the last part of chapter 16, where with the pouring out of the seventh bowl judgment, John writes of an enormous earthquake, the like of which had never been experienced before. In chapter 17, using apocalyptic symbolism, he informs us that this city of man, situated on seven hills, serves as the headquarters of a series of kings whose intention was to wage war on the land. And in chapter 18, we read, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And then in verse 8, we read that she will be consumed by fire. And in verse 10, he adds, In one hour your doom has come. As we saw last time, the remainder of chapter 18 was devoted to the response of both heaven and earth to the news of Babylon's demise. Heaven sounded, resounds with praise because God's judgments are just and he will repay this evil in such a way as punishes or the punishment that fits the crime of the prostitute. Then a series of laments rise from the inhabitants of the earth. So while heaven rejoices at the news of Babylon's destructions, and even as God warns his people to flee from the arms of the prostitute, three times in verses 4 through 19, John reports the anguished laments of the kings, the merchants and the sea captains, who, seduced by the prostitute, their ill-gotten gains are wiped out, and the fate of that great city becomes an eerie foreshadowing of the judgments that will come upon the worshippers of the beast and his image, those who bear his mark as to buy and to sell, and the incapacity to do just that. It's that there that Revelation chapter 18 ends with a description of Babylon being crushed by a giant millstone. No longer will there be sounds of laughter or music. No longer will there be sounds of commerce. And in the same way as the prostitute has enabled the beast to shed the blood of God's servants, so God will remove all life from her streets. That glittering and prosperous Babylon is destined to become a wasteland home to nothing but demons and vultures. So we have this contrast between the painted lady of chapter 16 and the lamb's bride of chapter 19. While the former is committing adultery with the nations, the bride of Christ is preparing herself for the bridegroom. On the one hand, there's the seductress holding a cup full of abominable things 
seating on a, seated on a scarlet beast, dressed in purple and scarlet, bedecked with gold and precious stones, drunk on the blood of the saints, and on the other, the Lamb's bride, who is making herself ready, dressed in fine linen, bright and clean, that is given to her to wear. So if chapter 18 heralded the end of the persecution of the suffering church, chapter 19 acclaims the long-awaited wedding supper of the Lamb. Five times in the first six verses, the word Hallelujah rings out from the heavenly throng, which not only includes the 24 elders and the four living creatures, but all God's servants throughout redemptive history, those who have given their lives for Christ, believing God's promise to save sinners and take them to be with him in glory. They've been longing for this day to arrive. And thus John reveals, declares, records what he hears in heaven so that we on earth may join in that celebration, praising and worshipping God who not only judges Babylon, but who also has redeemed men and women from every tongue, tribe, nation and people. Unlike the Old Testament, the New Testament doesn't contain many hymns. In the Old, we find the Song of Moses, the Songs of Miriam and Deborah, and of course, the Psalms of David, Asaph and the Sons of Korah. Certain of these songs were sung to accompany the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, the songs of ascents, songs expressing confessions, longings and laments. There are relatively few songs in the New Testament. We do, of course, find the Magnificat of Mary, My soul magnifies the Lord in Luke chapter 1. There's the Benedictus of Zechariah, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, at the end of Luke chapter 1. The Nuncdibitis of Simeon, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, Luke chapter 2. Together with some of the traces of what are thought to be songs in one or two of the epistles. With regard to those of which we are certain, Luke describes the praises of ordinary people who are awaiting the consolation of Israel and the redemption of Jerusalem. The births of John the Baptist and of Jesus would never have made the headlines of the Jerusalem Daily of that time. But these insignificant people had eyes of faith and they saw that the one who was to be born and who was being born was in fact the great Redeemer of Israel. They were pointing to a turning point in history. They placed their trust in God and rejoiced because he had heard and answered their prayers. The other place where songs are to be found in the New Testament is here in this book of Revelation. Those who believe that Revelation only speaks about Armageddon and the millennium, I'm sorry, they are wrong. The first chapter of Revelation is based on worship. It's the greatest hymn book in the New Testament. There's praise everywhere. Worship from those gathered in heaven around the throne, God and the Lamb and praise from the faithful on earth. Handel, in his oratorio, the Messiah, based two of his choruses on the most well-known songs of this book, the Hallelujah Chorus and Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We may not have the talent of Handel, but whenever we sing praises to God, not only are we worshipping him, but we are declaring to the world that we refuse to let ourselves be seduced by Babylon. John Piper put it like this, Corporate worship is the public savouring of the worthy, worth, beauty, power and wisdom of God. Worship is an open declaration to all the powers of heaven and to all of Babylon that we will not prostitute our minds, hearts or our bodies 
to the allurements of the world. Worship is far more than singing, of course. We don't merely sing hymns and songs. Yes, we do sing to celebrate and proclaim the God of heaven and earth, but we also worship him by paying attention to what he is saying to us through his word. We worship him by communicating with him, by praying, by seeking to follow his instructions as we live our lives from day to day in such a way as to honour him in everything that we do. We need to remind ourselves again that this book was sent first and foremost to encourage those Christians, those persecuted Christians of the first century in Asia Minor. The book was to be read aloud in its entirety at least seven times to those seven churches mentioned in the opening chapters as the messenger took it or copies of it to each church along the way. These letters each contained a blessing to the people who heard and put it into practice. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is in it because the time is near. So reading wasn't done in private. It was a hushed individual exercise with a polite, quiet notice, uh, such as used to be the cases in libraries across Great Britain. These were public, audible readings as the church members met together, very much like a public reading of God's word in some church services today. If we read this book as they did, that would totally transform our understanding of its message. And I suggest it would lead us to even deeper worship. Towards the end of the funeral dirges of chapter 18, mourning the fall of Babylon, comes the invitation to celebrate. Rejoice, rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. And the opening words of chapter 19, we find after this, John is permitted to hear heaven's response to that invitation. Now the passage is clearly divided into three parts. Praise for the fall of Babylon in verses 1 to 4. Praise which anticipates the wedding feast of the Lamb, verses 5 to 9. And then finally John's response in verse 10. So let's dig into the passage itself. Rejoice, Babylon demise. After this I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. I've mentioned the invitation in our last study that celebrates the fall of Babylon. And here we have it. The hosts of heaven do indeed respond with the oft-repeated refrain, Hallelujah. This term, which only occurs here in the whole of the New Testament, comes from two Hebrew words, Halal and Yah, meaning praise Yahweh terms which must have already been in use by the Hellenistic Jews before the Christian era and adopted by the New Testament church. This is not a small group rejoicing in heaven. John speaks of the roar of a great multitude singing God's praises. Now we first came across this multitude back in, in chapter 7, first described in terms of of a military formation of 144,000. And then when John turned to see, he saw that it was a multitude that no one could count. They hail from every nation, tribe, people, language, indicating that God draws his elect from among all nations. All of them have come out of the great tribulation, which I take to be the entire period between the first Advent and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember that each of those seven churches suffered persecution for the sake of the gospel. 
we remember too that the seal, trumpet and bowl judgments have been giving us an overall view of spiritual harm and God sealed his people to protect them from that harm. We find them again crying out from beneath the altar in chapter 6, verse 10. How long, Sovereign Lord, uh, and Sovereign and True, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth, avenging our blood? So this in tribulation may indeed intensify horrific persecution connected to the return of our Lord ensues. And Jesus encourages us to hold fast to what we have so that no one can take our crown. So it's as true today as it was then. But salvation and glory belong to God, which we've seen from the beginning of this song. For the vast majority of people today, God means nothing at all. OMG is used everywhere. People think nothing of it because God means nothing to them. But glory and power belong to him. He's not a non-entity. He is omnipotent. He holds the whole world in his hand, as the hymn puts it. And we do well to remember this and challenge all who take his name in vain. But after the rejoicing of the fall of Babylon in the first three verses, we come to the Amen of heaven's court. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down, worshipping God who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. So the sight of Babylon going up in smoke not only produces Hallelujah from the multitude of saints in heaven, but the Lord's courtiers also join, crying, worship and hallelujah. Once again, we find an echo of the Old Testament, because back in Psalm 106, verse 48, we read, Praise to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen, praise the Lord. There the Israelites praised the Lord for delivering them from their enemies who had oppressed them, who had subjected them to their power. And despite their rebellion and sin, he took note of their distress and returned them to himself. He heard their cry. And now this is the case with the destruction of Babylon. Not only do the elders and living creatures join the hallelujahs of the redeemed saints, they add their Amen, formally ratifying God's just judgment. Verse 3 told us that the smoke from Babylon's destruction rises forever and ever. And Beale suggests that this portrayal of eternal judgment may be a partial response to Rome's claim of being eternal. Whether this is the case or not, heaven's courtiers endorse the verdict by crying, Amen, Hallelujah. But then comes earth's response. Following this Amen of the 24 elders and the four living creatures, another voice, this time from the throne, instructs the multitude of God's servants, both great and small, to praise God. Now this is the only place in the whole book where we read of a voice coming from the throne, telling people to praise God. Opinions are divided on the identity of this voice from heaven. But the least that can be said is that it indicates divine authorization of the speaker. He summons, or the voice summons, those in contrast to the first four, ver first four verses, where the emphasis is on those present in heaven, here the message is addressed to all, both great and small, on the earth. The same pattern can be found once again in Psalm 148, where the first six verses centre on praise of God in the heavenlies, whereas the last eight verses concentrate on praises from the earth. The phrase, praise our God, is akin to hallelujah 
and forms part of the liturgical vocabulary of the praise with which John's readers would have been familiar. And the terms small and great are idiomatic, referring to those of low and high estate. Not only is the destruction of the prostitute a cause for celebration, but the destruction of Babylon means that the con consummation of all things is just around the corner. Verses 6 and 7 continue with uh, intensified voices of praise. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad. Mighty noise. We read that this praise is akin to the roar of rushing waters and like peals of thunder. I can only guess what a visit to Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls must be like. The nearest I can get to a large multitude shouting like this was when I had the privilege of attending a rugby match between France and the All Blacks in the Stade de la Bourgeoise in Nantes in France. During the game, I tried to speak to my neighbour, Robert, but he couldn't hear a thing that I was saying because of the mighty noise that was going up around the stadium. But even that pales into insignificance compared with the praise that surrounds God's throne. And then the Lord God Almighty reigns. This acclamation is indicative of two major developments, the first of which is in obscured by most translations. I've put it on the screen. Our Lord God Almighty reigns. But both Orn and Beale point out that the tense used means that he has begun to reign. In other words, God has begun to reign because Babylon has been destroyed. Now that doesn't mean that he has is not reigning already but that up to this point, according to his long-suffering mercy, he has allowed evil to run its course, even to the point of allowing the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, the prostitute, to persecute and seduce his people. But no longer is this the case. God's wrath is now complete. Babylon has fallen, and so he begins his reign in earnest. It's wedding time. This second development which prompts the enormity of the celebration is described as that of being the wedding of the Lamb. It, the wedding of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. As Johnson remarks, with the coming of the kingdom comes the wedding. Not only has the bride made herself ready, but fine linen, bright and clean, are given to her to wear. Now, I've already contrasted the gaudy garb of the prostitute and the pure linen of the bride. Walking with the Lord dressed in white was also promised to the faithful in Sardis, if you go back to chapter 3, verse 4. It was recommended for the shameful and wretched members of the Laodicean church in chapter 4, verse 18. And here it's described as being the righteous acts of the saints. Now, that's not to say that John is teaching salvation by works. Throughout Revelation, God's people are described as bearing witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ in both word and deed. In other words, they've been preparing themselves for this marriage supper by testifying to an unbelieving world of God's saving grace and the truth of the gospel. Their good deeds are a testimony to that sanctifying work of the Spirit in their lives. We only have to think of what the Apostle Paul wrote when addressing his letter to the Ephesians. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that's not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus 
to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Another way in which the bride prepares herself for the wedding is by remaining faithful to her bridegroom, resisting all the seductive influences of the prostitute. Now we saw last time that a voice from heaven issued her with a challenge, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. To resist the world, though this might involve persecution and economic hardship, as was the case with the faithful in Sardis, those who overcome receive this promise that they will be dressed in white. John's readers may well have recalled Isaiah's description in chapter 61 verse 10 when he wrote, I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. That is why I included Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 11 at the top of thy slides. Yahweh is said to be Israel's husband and Christ has now assumed that role. The righteousness of which Isaiah spoke points to the time when God will declare his people to be righteous and sanctify them. In other words, he was looking forward to the messianic age, the coming of the Lord Jesus, who not only provides his people with his own righteousness in justifying them, he goes on to transform them into a radiant, spotless bride, of whom Paul writes in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. So we come to the wedding invitation itself. Verse 9. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. This verse introduces us to the fourth of seven Beatitudes in Revelation. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. This final culmination of redemptive history is depicted as a great feast or celebration. It's not an invitation to a spiritual elite or to an exclusive group of Christians who have special merit while others are relegated to the role of observers. Back in Isaiah, once again, in chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, the prophet wrote, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines, and so on. The mountain to which he was referring is the heavenly Zion, the mount of assembly of which we've already spoken as being Harmoed in chapter 16, verse 16. The feast to which he was referring is none other than the great marriage supper of the Lamb. It may be true that the invited usually refers to a formal summons to friends and relatives to join in the festive occasion. But here, it's not the case. Since the bride herself is identified as all faithful Christians, the bride and those invited are identical. Now we have no idea what will be served at the wedding supper of the Lamb, but we have an idea of what it might be like. We know what we like to eat. In verses 7 and 8, the focus on the bride preparing herself for her nuptials. Verse 9 focuses on those who are invited and calls for a personal response to that invitation. When Jesus told the parable of the, uh, 
the wedding banquet in, in Matthew chapter 22 and in Luke 14. He spoke of a king who invited a certain number of important guests to a ceremonial meal, but they all turned down that invitation for a variety of spurious reasons. Here, in John's vision, such people would be those who would rather serve the beast and worship his image, or those who fail and flee the clutches to flee the clutches of the prostitute because they're too deeply enamoured with her charms. In the case of Jesus' parable, the king's judgment fell on those who rejected his gracious invitation. In those two accounts, the invited guests, the Jewish religious leaders, refused that invitation. And in Matthew's account, we read that the king told his servants that the wedding banquet was ready. Those who were invited didn't deserve to come. And so they were to go out into the highways and byways and gather anybody. Jesus went on to tell how the king provided his guests with appropriate wedding garments and anybody who attempted to gatecrash the party without being suitably clothed would also be destroyed. John describes the blessing of receiving an invitation from God himself to attend the wedding of his son. This invitation, as I've said, is not one addressed to a guest, but to the bride herself. This glorious messianic wedding of which the prophets dreamed and of which Jesus spoke in his parable has now become a reality. And on learning of the glories of what lies ahead, John reacts instinctively. But before I come to this, his reaction, I'd just like to make one final comment about this wedding. We have a picture of the immensity of God's love for his people. The moment when one's beloved enters the main door of a church, usually several minutes late, is a very powerful moment with the husband-to-be waiting patiently at the front of the gathered assembly. Everyone stands for the wedding march or whichever piece of music has been chosen. Emotions run high, but they're nothing compared to the intensity of Christ's love for his church. Nowhere is there any mention of the marriage of the son. It's always the wedding of the lamb that is portrayed. And that is only possible because the bridegroom himself, the lamb, suffered, sacrificed himself for his bride. Jacob worked for 14 years in order to marry Rachel. Boaz sacrificed his inheritance in order to marry Ruth. Jesus sacrificed his life in order to espouse the church. And this is true. The angel anticipates the objection that all this is too good to be true by telling John that these are the true words of God. Some would limit this to the blessing which has just been given. But it's also true that the whole of the book, throughout the whole of the book, we are assured that these are the words of he who is faithful and true. There's one more obvious contrast between this wedding supper of the Lamb to which the bride is invited and the great supper of God which is described in verses 17 and 18. There the birds are invited to feed upon the flesh of God's enemies. On that of the kings, the generals, the mighty, the horses, the riders, the flesh of all, both free and slave, great and small, at the end of history there will be two wedding suppers and all will attend one or the other. Either you will eat or you will be eaten. You're either a guest who dines at God's table or you are the dinner. 
the dinner of the vultures. The first is a reward for faith and righteousness, the other a punishment for the unbeliever and wickedness. So let's come lastly to John's reaction. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you. John was so overwhelmed by the magnificence of the wedding scene and the benediction given to those who attend that his immediate reaction was to fall at the angel's feet. But the angel quickly reprimanded him, telling him that he is only a messenger. And one is mindful of a similar reaction by Cornelius to Peter in Acts chapter 10. The role was to hold on to the testimony of Jesus in the face of persecution and the seduction of the marriage supper. Some people wonder why John should be so naive as to fall at the feet of an angel. I should point out that he does exactly the same thing later on in chapter 22 verses 8 and 9. Could it be that because the angel was such an overwhelming being, we need to remember that this angel had just pronounced an awesome blessing on all those who are invited to the Lamb's wedding supper. Sam Storms points out three reasons why the Spirit through John includes this detail. First of all, the angel is the giver of of prophetic revelation, perhaps explaining why John falls down to worship. But by rejecting this worship, the angel refuses to accept this status. He is but a creature like John. He directs John to worship God as the true transcendent source of revelation. The angel wants to make it clear that when it comes to revelation, he is among those who received it, while Jesus is the one who gives it. Storms makes a second point that John may be re reinforcing one of the major themes of this whole book, the difference between true worship and idolatry, because everyone in Revelation worships either God or the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The third suggestion is that this scenario presents us with an example and a warning of how easy it is to be deceived and seduced into idolatry. So we have our invitation and we can praise God for it. We, like John, have been invited. We've made made fit to attend the wedding supper of the Lamb. We have one responsibility and privilege, that to worship God. By holding fast to that self-same message of what God has done for sinners in the person of Jesus Christ, we are even now preparing ourselves to receive that wedding garment of fine linen, bright and clear. We have no righteousness of our own to bring, only that of the one who died to save us and purify us from our sin. As we often sing in the words of Stuart Townend, in Christ alone my hope is found. So all of us who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith alone have received that wedding invitation, invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He will provide us with the bright linen, clean and spotless. We're invited to a glorious feast, celebrating the destruction of everything that is evil, the final vindication of his grace and judgments. And we know that there will be no more death, no more despair, no more pain or suffering, we will take part in that glorious wedding of the King's Son and we will be his bride without spot nor wrinkle nor any other blemish. 
Indeed, we will be holy and without fault, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 5. My prayer is that this will touch your hearts and that you will glorify him as he has spoken to me and helped me through this study. May God bless you. Amen.